Hey, Kevin. Hey, Roger. How's everyone doing? Well, I guess it's just you right now. <laughs> so I'm not hearing your uh, your audio. Can you hear me now? Maybe I'm just not speaking loud. I don't enough. know if that's my problem or yours. Just a minute. Is that any better? Check, check. Still nothing? Okay. Is that better? Yeah, I'm still not hearing you. Huh. I'm unmuted. When I speak, the little green bars moving up and down the microphone. Anybody else online test the uh, audio here? Hello? This is Jay, and uh, I hear, hear both of you. Um, Are you talking, uh, Kevin, Jay? <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, and Kevin, you. you uh, you, you're loud and clear for me. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk again, Kevin. Can you hear me now? Okay. I was on my AirPods and I, I couldn't hear you, um, but mm. I'm back on my computer, so uh, I'm still not hearing you, Kevin. Oh, really? Still nothing. Roger, can you hear me? Morning. Morning, Dave. Morning. Okay, now I, I can hear you guys now. So say something, Kevin, to make sure I'm hearing you. Check, check. Yeah, okay. Did you hear? I don't know what my problem was. Anyway, figure it out later. At least you guys trained out before the meeting started. That's why we start early. That's why I start early. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, how's everybody? Good. Did we get any questions? I did not. We'll make up some questions. Can we make up the answers too? <laughs> uh, yeah, we're about to try. This is what I did this week. <laughs> I made snowmen for my grandkids. I don't know if you can. That one's a snow woman. Are they Marvel Marvel characters? The one, well, the one of them is a Captain America snowman. My youngest grandson's five, and he's a big superhero. And then I have one granddaughter, so I made a snow woman, and uh, and I actually turned the the hair and all in one piece, and then I used a Dremel a Dremel tool to shape it around the face so that the hair is just on the back, and and made it actually look like hair. And my granddaughter, uh, my granddaughter says that. You don't have to put snowmen away in the summer. You can leave them out. Good. 
Uh, it's a little bit like Christmas all year round. Yeah, she said snowmen are, you can have them out all year. You don't have to wait for Christmas. So what's the difference between a snowman and a snow woman? The hair. Okay. <laughs> so this one, I'm going to put a picture. I thought the difference was snowballs. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not going to oh, tell my weird. 10 year old granddaughter that. <laughs> <laughs> That's rude. <laughs> how, old, how old is she? She's 10. Oh. If she's younger, you might have been able to convince her that she has to put it in the freezer in the summertime to keep it from melting. Well, she likes this one because it's made out of wood. I turned it on a lathe and <laughs> she, can sit it, she can have it sitting on her desk all year, she says. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, my 14-year-old grandson looked at his and said, wow, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a little tougher audience these days. You sure what he, what he What's that? Did he ask you where to put the batteries? No. <laughs> no, but he had a... Last summer, he was over, and we were outside playing beanbag toss, and uh, he he confided in me that he's 14 years old, and with this COVID, you can't get your first kiss with a mask on. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, He's just going to have to wait. Patience. It's worth, it'll make it just that much sweeter. He's 14. There's no patience. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I told him, I said, you know, that's a tough call. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, you know, make sure she's in a 14 day quarantine first. He's <laughs> like, yeah, that, that lacks spontaneity. <laughs> yeah. We're going to plan this out, mark it on the calendar. Well, this is, this is what I've been doing the last couple of days. My wife wanted a set of six uh, salad bowls. Oh. I do have a question for Mr. Meredith. Sir. I want to show you something. So... I, I, I maybe I'm dense. I just figured it out. So I just did this little vase, right? Mm -hmm. And it's Paduke. Yeah. Which, which I, I, it, but it was very, very dry Paduke. It was very old. But uh, Paduke's messy to work with. Uh, but uh, so I used the Pens Plus on that. And it came out pretty good uh, overall. Uh, but I put it on the be all and used the, uh, the wax, just the wax, the third step on the buffing system. And that thing came out like glass. Have you ever, have you ever tried using the buffing wheel on your pens plus? Sure. It works great. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Now, what, what you're doing is, um, you know, with the friction polishes, heat is your friend. And anytime you can heat that surface, you take, it's surprising how little heat it takes to melt shellac. What you're doing is, is remelting the shellac, reapplying it, spreading the wax more evenly, and actually buffing the wax. So, yeah. That'll work really well. Is that now, include, I did, uh, using I, the uh, triple E and the, uh, and the white one? The white I didn't do that. Uh, I sanded it on the lathe. That one I sanded up to 1200. Yeah. And uh, so I had it really, really smooth uh, before I put any finish on it at all. And uh, I just had, I had 
a bottle of the Pens Plus that only had just a little bit in the bottom. So I just wanted to use up what was left in that one bottle, and uh, and it came out it came out pretty good except where the knot is. Yeah, it didn't want to shine where the knot was. It Remember, was shine is a reflection, so to speak, of the surface. Photons come in. Ideally, we want them to turn around and go back out by exactly the same path. That never happens. Any place where the surface is rough, you know, my, my analogy is that the even a well-finished piece of wood looks like the Himalayas to a photon. Anything you can do to fill in the valley will make the shine, will make the re reflection closer to that, you know, exact reversal of, of entry. And a knot is, even if you, even if you've uh, sanded the bejesus out of it, is going to have a different texture than the surrounding wood. Now, the way you get around that is before you put on um, uh, your film finish, use a sanding sealer to basically fill in as much of the surface as you can, like the high build friction polish or a one pound cut shellac um, is a good, a good choice there also. So anything that, that perfects that surface improves your ultimate shine. When I put it on the be all system after using the pens plus that knot, it, it disappeared. The, the difference yeah. in the sheen on that knot just went away. Remember what I said, it takes very little to actually melt that shellac and fill in because the, the, you know, if you put your finger right behind the buffing wheel, that's hot. And you, you've actually, I think, I think what happened is you, you actually forced uh, the shellac into the, into the, the wood a little better filled up the valleys a little bit more and you got a, a better reflection of light. One theory. So would it help to uh, use all three uh, buffing wheels, the uh, triple no. E? And... Uh -uh. Because the other two are abrasives. Yeah. So you're taking off what you just put on. So the, you know, the, the, the triple E and the offer, for, for, well, for, for things like polyurethane, um, that might help because you can actually improve the, Sorry improve the surface um, of the polyurethane by the real fine abrasives. With the Pens Plus, the shellac is so much finer than than, yeah. than the polyurethane that you're, you're not going to improve your, your lot there. Yeah. I thought it worked out for you. It looked very nice. Oh, it came out. Uh, I was going to give it to my daughter for Christmas, but I think I might keep it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Duke is one of those, you know, once you get past the sawdust in your nose, um, Paduk is a great wood to work with. It, yeah, other than the the orange dust everywhere. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, that will, uh, and it burns too. When you get it, you get it trapped in those membranes in your nose. It it's an acidic wood, which is why you finish. you never oh. put beeswax on Paduk because it will turn it into white dust as you watch. Because the wood itself, the residual oils are sufficiently acidic that it will just, oh, that's nice. That's a very classic sort of shape. Anything you yeah. can do to keep the color? This one, I don't think Paduk is photoreactive, Paduk, is it? Paduk is not too bad. It will brown a little bit, but not not like, you know. Like Purple Heart. Heart. Yeah. And not like, uh, like Purple Heart. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I actually tried one time to to make a finish that was light protective. Uh, I, had some, I had some friends that said they used to put copper tone in their their finishing solutions, and they swore it worked. So, yeah, I tried a couple of things, and it was not worth the effort. And, and Bill, yes, yeah. the wall thickness in here is less than a quarter of an inch. Less than a quarter. Less than a quarter. Of, I I turned it really really thin. It's it, it might be a quarter of an inch, but not Con not nice. not much nice. more. Consistent all the way through. Yep. Dead even all the way from awesome. the top to it's the bottom. It's a nice shape. Yeah, hey, it's a real real nice form, John. I uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Real I put nice a form. I put a bead on the top. Yeah. Uh yeah, I just had this chunk of. 
Paducah out in the shop. It, it's been out there for. That's a pretty good sized piece of Paducah. That's a big chunk. Yeah, it's. I think it's uh, seven inches tall. Yeah. Like six. What do you use to, to hollow it with? Uh, well, I I you went ahead and used a Forstner bit, uh, just so I could get my my initial cut, and then I used my uh, that Simon Hope arm I have. Oh yeah. That uh, is that like the one that holds like has a thing here? No, it you mount it. Next turning talk, I'll have it set up. Okay. okay. But it's one of the hinged. Yeah, it's a. It goes, it goes uh, into your tailstock. Right. It it doesn't go to the tailstock. It mounts on the ways of the bed. And then it has a post that comes up and an articulating arm. Hmm. So, literally, it it's supporting both ends of your hollowing. And it's on an arm that that you just you set your height, and then you all you're doing is just very gently going back and forth. And uh, so that, that leads into one of the topics I was going to talk about today, and that's uh, how you how you start hollowing. And um, I think I like you know you did John start with a, a Forrester bit. Um, the problem I've had is uh, when I go deep, I use a uh, an extender for the uh, Forrester bit. It goes into Morris paper, and I've got. Two extenders and two Forrester bits that are fused together right now. <laughs> yeah, they they tend to get hot and they tend to wobble a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I was looking online for uh, deep hollowing tools, and uh, I came up with the. Um, I saw a video on using uh, rather than using the extenders to use a. Um, um, Oh, what's the word for the uh, compression? Not, not compression. Um, collet. Collet. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, You're st stick it in the collet and um, put it in the uh, tailstock and hold the uh, force a bit with the collet, and uh, that works really, really well. Yeah. So, you have the you have the Colt Forsner bits. I have whatever you get at Lowe's. Okay. Actually, that's not true. Up to two inches, I have a, a set. Uh, but for the bigger ones, I have one up to three inches that I got at, uh, at Rockler, whatever brand they... they uh, yeah, these are um, Colt. They're the best Forstner bits I've ever used. And their extensions are actually taper locks. So there's no screw. So your, your extender oh, okay. and bit is balanced all the way through. So it doesn't yeah. waggle. Um, that's good because the, uh, the extenders with the uh, little set screws, they just, you know, well, they're, yeah. they're not balanced. You know, they, they really can't. Yeah. 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 That's uh, well, the, the Colt, the Colt Forstner bits are definitely on my, uh, wish list. Well, they're, they're so sharp and they're so easy to sharpen. That's the, yeah. Nice thing. Yeah. plus the extenders, you know, plus they, the, they, the way they lock in though, that right. is really cool. Yeah, they do tend to kind of lock together, but you keep a set of wrenches there, you know, like a yeah. little Marvel mystery oil in the joint and they'll come right loose. Um, hey, Roger. Unless they have a yeah. more... hmm? what? That's me. Yeah. Sorry for interruption. What size portion bit do you typically start with? Um, I take it in steps. Usually I, I Probably if, I, if I'm going up to my three inch one, I'll use two smaller ones, maybe three quarters and then an inch and a half and then go for the big one. Let's do one, two, three. Yeah, that's what I was gonna recommend because I, I do that too. And I, I actually have a, uh, a one inch carbide Forstner bit that I use most of the time <clears throat> to start with. Mm -hmm. And then I just use larger sizes as I need to. Yeah. I'll get the rest of it. It goes a lot faster. It's a lot cooler. Is there a problem about the Forsner bit not having a, a point to hold it on center? Because you're drilling out mostly air once you get yeah. started. Um, and I, I thought about uh, that as a problem. And what I do <clears throat> is I'll, I'll start with the biggest Forsner bit that I'm going to use and drill about a quarter inch in. And then I'll go to the next smaller one and drill another quarter inch and then the next smaller one and oh, quarter inch. Oh, that's a good idea. And I'll use the one inch and drill all the way through. 
And that gives me a, a, a way to start that's pretty much on the center. Right. Good idea. It helps a lot. Of course, it can still wander, but uh, it doesn't wander much. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. It's a really good idea. I, uh, I actually had one uh, thing I was working on, and I used a four inch hole saw without the center in it. Mm. And I used that to go the depth of the hole saw first. And because then how, if how my, you get the wood out of the hole saw? I, I, did, I didn't go all the way through. Okay. I just went in and then I backed the hole saw out. But, but what, I, what happened when I did that is as I stepped up in Forstner bits, it didn't matter if they were a little bit off because I already had the outside the size I wanted it. Oh, yeah. So I see. So you, uh, I see what you did. Yeah. So you didn't really cut the uh, use the whole saw just to do the print. Uh, just just the, the biggest dimension I could get. Yeah. I, I have a question about about that. Just what we're talking about. Um, does it matter what size hole you make, other than how much you have to hollow out with the with your tool? Um, could you just make a hole small enough to get your uh, cutting head in there or like like what what size would you recommend the, the, the least the smallest hole could be or the smallest portion of that size well i always you know even if i'm not using forester bits i always start a hollowing with a, a drill bit i have a, a drill attached to a handle on that i just go into the depth i want with the uh, with the drill with the drill and that sort of sets your uh, your depth uh, and then go from there. Okay. But as Jim says, you know, you got to, you can't take it all in one, even with a three horsepower lay that I've got, if you put a three inch Forrester bit in there, uh, it stalls. <laughs> Doesn't like that. You, you can certainly hollow through a small hole, but you're increasing your challenge. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, uh, it, it, the chips you have to clear a lot faster and more often right that's a good point the other thing is if you're uh for those who haven't used forester bits you need to clear every half inch or three quarters of an inch once you get in there because you'll you'll get to a point where you can't get the you can't get the forester bit out <laughs> I've that's never good than, i ruined more than one pepper mill doing that yeah because mm -hmm. it, so, it did not come loose so you can make it a uh, enhancement to your uh, your uh, hollow form. Leave it in there and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. make a magnetic stand for it or something. But it's, it's amazing yeah. how, how tight they get. I actually I, I actually got one stuck in a pepper mill too. It's funny you mentioned that. I was doing a somebody ordered a a one foot long uh, walnut pepper mill and. And I got one stuck in there and I had to take my Dremel tool and clean all of that out of there to get the bit out. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I found if I, if I, um, I got a little bracket on my lathe that, that I put the, um, the squirt head for my compressor. So I have a stream of air going in all the time. Mm -hmm. And that stops it. Yeah. it it's the, the wood that gets behind the bit that actually causes it to freeze. So if you can keep that constantly being removed, it's just easier, you know, we get lazy. Um, Trent Bosch uses that, uh, he, is it a gun drill or gun board yes, drill? Right, right. And it's like a, it's like just a regular drill, but it has a hole for air to come through too. Right. So, so you, just, it's, it's yeah. actually, it's actually a machining tool. Right. Yeah. Machine Metal machine. machining. Right. Huh. You watch the sales up at Boeing and, <laughs> you know, when they have their, their big shop sale, like every two years, they always have just tables of of the gun drills wow and you just hook up your compressor to it and you just, it just blows it out mm. cool when are those when are those uh sales about every two years and they actually <laughs> put an ad in the the seattle times because i mean it's I, I went to one and it's you know it's like the mob scene from dr Zhivago. it's 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 impressive to see what they do have in a machine shop and why they, why they would get rid of it is the question <coughs> you know they're you know multi thousand dollar milling machines and you know just incredible stuff and little hand you know hand tools 
You probably Always. pick up a 737 Max pretty cheap there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, they're, they're trying to bring that back. They're actually hire, hiring a core of pilots to train yeah. uh, for the 737 Max to get it back in in uh, in circulation. Oh, so yeah. I think the plane is ready. You just need people's confidence. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's it's crazy to see all the planes at the Moses Lake Airport in eastern Washington. Oh, yeah. They're just stacked in there. Yep. Why are there so many? That no, was the one that uh, there were a couple of crashes, and so oh. they grounded them all. Yeah, the whole oh, fleet. Oh, oh. Yep. Oh, the 737. <laughs> There's a one, of the, one of the machinists that was in the Reser Coast Guard Reserve worked for me in Seattle and he uh, he worked for Boeing and I got a tour of that place one time and some of the yeah. some of the machines they have there are pretty impressive but uh, uh, to R Roger's question why would they get rid of that well believe it or not it's because if if a plane crashes when they when they when the uh, safety board does their review they go all the way back to certifying the machines that made it Right. So uh, he used to bitch about that all the time. That There's a, a fixed number of hours on any, particularly the, 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 the critical boring machines. Yep. And once you get that fixed number of hours. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's out done. it goes. Yep. And uh, hmm. he gave me a rivet gun. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Yeah, and on the topic of tools, uh, so hollowing tools. I bought a, a monster hollowing set. I think it was it Albuquerque. It was an AEW symposium many years ago. It's still sitting in the box in my garage. That's how often I, I do hollow forms. But did I, I, there's a, a woman on Instagram. Uh, I don't know. I should check, see who's here. Okay. She, she likes to she likes to fancy herself a, a, a Ashley Harwood knockoff. I mean, a woman that would, would turn in a tank top has got an agenda. Anyway, she does interesting work, but she has a, a tool that she's been sort of promoting that I thought kind of was interesting. It's a, uh, it's a, a modified bowl gouge she uses for boxes. And it's just to make, you would use it for anything where you want to cut a square corner. Let's see. Uh, For the AAW Master Series, I just, I think Ashley Harwood is on the schedule to come up in, uh, I don't, I think maybe March or something like that. What are you going to do? Nice to you. What it does is it, it cuts this beautiful straight edge with a square bottom. So square bottom. Yeah. She's turning a box there. You can see that that really nice angle. Yeah, yeah. What is the what's the profile of the do you have a the tool profile of the tool? Is a bull gouge that she's turned into a negative rake scraper. Huh. Uh. I don't even, I can't even imagine that. Is that the pith in the center? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, that's the, the flute in the center of the, but yeah, it's an end grain box. So huh. I mean, it's, it's cutting through end grain pretty cleanly. Let's see. Yeah. So, so what is her picture of the tool? Well, that is the tool right there. Where? All right. So let's see. What is her channel name so we can look at it, Mike? Uh, Lathe the Back, L A T H E D B A C K. Slow down. Okay. On Lathe Back. Yeah. Lathe Back? Yeah. Isn't she in like Chicago or something? Yeah, she's in Illinois somewhere. Hmm. Her window is closed. Okay. And she's an Ashley Harwood knockoff, huh? No, oh, she'd like to be. Her work is not like as good. <laughs> so is it like, so if this is the, yeah, I'm, if this is the, <laughs> the, the, the profile, does she, she, she,
grinds it that way and then grinds it this way. Yeah, I with the the screen. Let's, let's try a screen share again. Oh okay. wow! So is it just a round bar? No, oh. it's a, it's a what an old bar. Whoa! Huh? Looks catchy. Well, with yeah. the negative rake, it probably isn't. Yeah. I think that was catchy so in, the, was in, the, in another use of the term. <laughs> I guess That's the question a is. Gouge. You know, like a spindle, right? Yeah. yeah. I, she says it's a bowl gouge. And we'll see if we can see it. Kind of shell of glued on it. Well, the reality is, is the cutting edge is all the shape of a negative rake scraper. None of the flute, or is the flute. The flute isn't on the cutting edge at all. No. Yeah. The cutting edge so there's right no real there. point to the flute here. Yeah. You could make Other the same you thing a with a round bar. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. you do get the flat on the bottom. I mean, you do get a, a, you know, a flat cutting edge. And it looks like the way she's using it. Let's see. Let me get the other one up. Huh. Uh, You should put your monster system up for, for the uh, tool slot. Yeah. No, I have every intention of using it. <laughs> so, so the only thing the, flute, the only thing the flute does on this tool is weaken the tool so you get more vibration. I mean, it's not part of the cutting edge. No. No. Actually, and so she's using, down. You want, she's using the flute to stabilize it. The flute, yeah. the flute is laying it flat on the tool. She's got it. Oh, 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 got it. Well, you've got yeah. this square corner. And, you know, uh, one of the things that if, uh, one of the things the flute would do as you get toward the bottom is going to give an exit route for chips. So you get stuff out of the way, which is one of the benefits of the negative rake scraper, I think. Except it's upside down. Right, it's, it's upside able. down. So that's, the flute isn't doing anything there. I'm I'm oh. I'm a little bit skeptical. I think the flute, the only thing the flute's doing, if you have the tool upside down, is that it's offering you an opportunity to gouge your tool rest. That too. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. I mean, if, I don't see what she take, gets out of that that she wouldn't get from just a negative rake scraper. Well, exactly. The square yeah. corner is the only thing. Yeah. yeah. The, the flute, the fact that there's a flute in there, uh, it gives it uh, stability from rolling sideways. Yeah. So it right. the, uh, uh, eliminates torque or controls the torque on a rotational sense along the axis of the tool. Uh, yeah, so I just have do it flat. with a bar stock and grind it flat on the top on on the bottom exactly. of it. Exactly. And then yeah. just grind your. Right. Uh, here's here's a here's a box master scraper that looks just like yeah. hers without the flute. I mean. Right. I mean, right. Mike. Right. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, it's yeah. You see, I mean, it's still, it's a creative use of a bowl gouge that she probably wasn't using anymore. <laughs> yeah, sure. But it does make a nice square corner. So, yeah. whether a square scraper would do any better. So does anyone know. else have a hollowing system they, uh, they like? I'm kind of a hollowing system addict. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like the monster system because I got to use it at the, at the symposium. I actually made a little hollow form on theirs. And I bought it, and I haven't opened it since. Well, the, the guy that um, started that, uh, he passed away, and the company went to his son. And I don't think they did, they supported it for a couple of years, but I think they uh, yeah. sort of gave up on it. Well, the monster was nice because you could get all different sizes and and yeah. custom tool rests that were the same color as your lathe. Not a big deal, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it, it worked really well, and I have every intention of of breaking it out and starting to use it again. Uh, Tim Yoder, I think, took over. I think he bought Monster from... Uh, he, 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 bought, uh, he bought Elbow. Elbow. Yeah. Same uh, deal. It's, it's the supported... It's, a, it's the same concept that they articulated. Yeah. Um, I've, the, I've got his system, and I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. Um, you can get I bought one. the Simon Hope, and... Uh, 
I, I have Trent Bosch's, uh, the gouges are actually Trent Bosch's following system. Uh, and you got a captured it, bar system? What's that? Is it a captured bar system? Like, uh, yeah. Jameson? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the Trent Bosch system that has the little cutter in the, that you glue into the end. And then my, that fits into the articulating handle that's mounted. You just mount it on your tailstock and you use your uh, tool rest as a midway point for adjustment. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I like it because it, it doesn't beat you up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, I was looking at the Trent Bosch system. Uh, it was a, a video placement system. Yeah. And uh, I only wanted the arm. I didn't want the whole system. And when the symposium was here in Portland, uh, Simon Hope was going back to England and still had that system and said, Hey, I'll sell it to you for this much. If you buy it right now. And I said, okay. He didn't want to take it back. Yeah. Well, the, the nice thing about starting with a, uh, a Forester bit, you've got clean sides and hollowing, you know, the, the cleaner the sides are, the easier it is to hollow. And I don't know what you guys do, but I, I found that um, hollowing with a pull stroke, uh, going from the bottom and pulling up works a lot better than anything else that I've tried. Uh, so I, I generally just do one direction. I go all the way to the bottom and pull straight up all the way through. On end grain, that's the best, I think, because that's supported. You're cutting with supported fibers. You're, you're cutting downhill. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Grain Except supported. for the, the shoulder where, where you're going from the opening to the widest point, you need to reverse and go the other direction. Right. So you're cutting downhill. Yeah. Um, so yeah. always from the smallest diameter, largest. So that, right. that's first uh, a straight base for something that has a curve in it then. Um, Smallest to largest diameter. Well, yeah. so, uh, still, I guess on a curve, I still I still use the pull stroke. Um, so it's just a little more. The, the top is obviously the hardest part. And I, I generally do the top by hand with a, with a, um, uh, a curve tool. Mm -hmm. So. But okay. for the next turning talk, I'll set mine up and show you how that articulating arm works. And the, the one thing, the other thing I like about it is uh, he recommends that you, you use that hollowing system at about 1300 RPMs. Ooh. And, uh, you know, I thought the same thing. <laughs> uh, I thought, well, that's a little fast. Uh, I'm not Jimmy clues, but uh I, I think 1250 is what I hollowed that little uh, Paduke face out of. And uh, if you get the, if you get your tool sharp, it, uh, it does a really nice clean job and it's, it's really easy to use. What kind of bit did you have? They're the carbide bits from Trent Bosch. Okay. And, uh, you know, I sharpen them by just, I got a little hand file and all I do is touch them up, go. And uh, does, a, does a pretty clean job. Uh, but if I turn it slower at 500, I get a lot of tear out. Well, you know, the, gen the general rule is speed is your friend. Yeah. Until it's not. Until it's not. <laughs> And, you know, but again, that's where if you have smooth sides, if, if you got, if it's bumpy, then your yeah. bar is just jumping all over the place. Yeah. That, that's the nice thing about the captured bar is that it, it, it holds it both top and bottom where the, uh, at least the one I have the, with the articulate, articulated arm, um, you have to hold it down against the tool rest to, to keep it steady. Yeah. So what, what do you use, Steve? Pardon me? Which what do I use of, for what? 
What hollowing system do you use? Oh, I use for the small stuff, I use the elbow tool. For the big stuff, I use a Stewart system. Okay. Uh, not the Stewart system. I, I have a Stewart system. I use the Bosch system. And, and then um, I've made a variety of little systems that I've tried to braise together myself out of cold rolled steel. And I use some of those for small stuff like ornaments. I have an old, probably the first captured bar system that's of historical interest, but not really practical. And that was made by Nichols over in Northeast Oregon. It's, it's a brute, but it's not very smooth. Oh, I, I remember it. So, someone had one of those systems at one of our tool swaps. Yeah, I think I was the sucker who bought it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> just oh, cool. out of historical interest yeah okay uh, do you remember those the the hollowing system that uh oh back in the, in the chem west days you know the, the two inch pipe systems what was his name um oh he was a contractor did it was very he was a, a oh, i don't remember davies chet um Anyway, he and Tom were buddies, but he was using a, a two inch pipe that he would mm. you know, stand like three feet behind the lathe and feed <laughs> right. the captured bar system to make these three foot hollow forms. Oh, God, why can't I remember his name? I had a, I had a hollowing system. My first hollowing system, I sold at the swap, tool swap a couple of years ago, but I, I made that out of pipes and yeah. I made it. Uh, I made, made it out of pipes and then I just took uh, some round stock and I bent it and, and put cutters in the ends of them. Yeah. Uh, and I brazed all that up and bent it and, well, and this everything was a, else. This was a pipe, inch and a half, two inches. He had an electrical cord on the inside so he had a light at the bottom so he could see where, because you know, literally he was, he was hollowing stuff three feet deep. Wow. And, uh, Oh, there's there was a guy on the big island named Griffin whose brother lived here. Maybe that was him. Because Griffin did big stuff no, like that. He's no? actually he's actually got a page in the Modern Masters of Wood Turning collection book. Uh, mm. we're, okay, now I gotta go look. Uh, <laughs> but he worked for somebody, the the first of the the, the predecessor of Ben Foe with the painting and um, piercing. Mm. Uh, all right. Well, now I'm crazy. I gotta go look. The local yeah. guy. Yeah, he's a contractor here in Portland. Well, while you're looking, here's my here's the last thing I've ever um, edited or that I've ever hollowed with a hollowing tool. <laughs> <laughs> it looked really big for a moment. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I used the nice capture shape. bar for that. <laughs> Wait, I used the capture bar for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I've been oh, working on Halloween. Speaking of Halloween, I mean, this is Halloween, but um, you can, I've, I've got uh, those hex, those Allen wrenches. I've yeah. got like a bag of them for a couple bucks. Of, I have like a hundred of them now, but you can make Halloween tools out of those. And they, and it really, they really do work. I mean, it's, it, you just sort of. What do you use for handles? Um. I just popped it in with some epoxy into a little, just a handheld, like, you know, it's like about that, that long uh -huh. uh, piece. And I just would wiggle in and it's, it works. But I've been doing it's, a lot it's of really fun. If you want to try hollowing, that's a, that might be a nice way to kind of get into it. Just do something small. It's a little bit like how we talk about if you're getting into wood turning, just don't, don't turn anything big. Just, just start small and, and, and try it. Yeah, I think up to about three inches you can do by hand. Anything more yeah. than that, then it gets oh. really tough. Yeah. I've been working on Halloween systems. No, I'm, I'm, I'm in a Zoom meeting. <laughs> do that. <Yeah. laughs> Anyways, I've been working on Halloween well, systems. Well, it's, it's, what it is is our, our uh, turning club Who's has that? a, a once Someone a month needs to mute, guys. Saturday. Roger, <laughs> mute. Turning talk. And uh, it's just whoever wants to get on. Um, Roger, just talk about different trying things. to mute. Guys just talk about their experience and doing different things. Pull, pull the switch on in there, Roger. There we go. 
I think I found the guy. Yeah. Anyways, Larry and I took a class uh, from Andy Wolf. Remember that, Larry? Oh, yeah. Where she uh, was trying to teach painting. She tried. And, I don't think the students were necessarily real sharp. Yeah, and I, I think I forgot what uh, she taught us as far as these iridescent paints. But anyways, so I've been trying to uh, to do that. And this is a, a hollowed, hollowed out system. Nice. And I, I used uh, John's spiraling tools for, for the top there. I don't know if that shows. Wow. Oh, nice. Yeah. So this is a, a piece of maple and walnut. And I, I tried different uh, blacking techniques. And the two that, um, that I had was one was a, a leather dye, Forby's leather dye. That was highly recommended. Mm -hmm. I used that on the base. Uh, for the top, I used uh, gesso. I don't know if anyone knows what gesso is. It's black gesso. It's what painters use on the paint. canvas. Yeah. And I found the gesso works. The gesso worked a lot better than the than the dye. Uh, at least mm -hmm. it took it. Uh, it's blacker and it took a finish better than the uh, than the dye. So, um, but anyways. Uh, that's a combination of carving because these panels here are uh, relief carved out. Um, what kind of I've got a question with that? regard to Holloway. Um, does anyone ever spin the and you know, do a reverse spin and in, in, in when, when they're particularly doing either something deep or something very close to the when I find it's very close to the top of the piece? in order to spin it the proper way, um, I would have to contort myself, right? To get the tool around, to get under the lip of the thing. So I find if I spin the, the, the lathe the other way that I, I'm not contorting myself to get under there. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you, so you reverse. turn your lathe in reverse. Correct. And turn on the far side instead of the close side. All right, yeah. so this way I don't have to contort myself to get under the lip if I'm doing something that sort of has a lip on it. Even if it's a bowl that kind of comes around the top, I'm trying to get under there, um, you know, I, 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 spinning I, I, in a normal I, I, direction is, is I have to contort myself. So I spin it the other way. Yeah, in fact, when I did, I, I did something, in fact, I showed it on, it was either Turning Talk or, or, <clears throat> or the, the show and tell that was a very tall, deep, um, vase, and I found that it was easier to spin it in reverse to be able to. I used a square carbide um, tip tool, to, and I found spinning it in reverse was just a lot more comfortable for me. And I wonder if I was violating some rule there. <laughs> no, I, turn, I, I use uh, reverse turning um, a couple things. One is for some cuts, it's easier to see because you're looking, you're not right. distorting like you're saying. But one thing I, I really caution you on is tighten your, your chuck down. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. Set screw in. Yeah, not all chucks yep. have a set screw for that. And um, that thing will come out really fast. And it'll right, my, my mind does. Yeah. So. yeah. Scares the hell out of me. <laughs> my Nova has a brake on it. And uh, I. I've had a couple of times where I was turning in reverse and I didn't have that thing quite tight. And that when that brake hits, it wants to come off. Yeah. But no, reverse turning, uh, there's a lot of cases where it makes it a lot easier. And I think also much safer as long as, as long as it's not touched and come off. Yeah. And they're often off around the other side of the lathe. What's that, Dave? Go around to the back side of the lathe if you have space, and then you don't have to worry about the chuck coming on down. The guy's name is Daryl Davis. And this Darryl is one of his pieces in the Nature uh, Transform. He worked for he worked with Frank Sidol. Wow. So cool. I stepped away for a second. What was his name again? Uh Daryl Davis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's that made out of? Wood. Oh, that's all painted? Yeah. Daryl right. was a local arborist. I don't know if he's still around or not. 
but yeah, uh, he, Sadal was the, the 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 predecessor, I guess, of the the painting and piercing. Um, because Ben Foe actually worked with him also, and right. Daryl was one of his students, and that's the sort of one thing. One of his proteges. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was hollowing these things down to you know piercing width, huge big things. So it's a challenge. Yeah. No joke. You know, I do have another question. I actually sent it in to you, Roger, and I apologize. Mm -hmm. I, it was 20 minutes before the meeting started. Yeah. Um, with regard to, I'm uh, making some uh, rolling pins mm -hmm. and don't know what to finish it with. So should I use walnut oil? Uh, my wife likes to use mineral oil when, she's, when she sands and, and, and re-finishes her cutting boards. And I'm wondering, gee, should I use mineral oil on it? I mean, what would you recommend for a rolling pin? I don't I'd recommend like mineral oil. oil. The problem Take with mineral that. oil is it doesn't stay. Within a month, it's evaporated. It's gone. Uh, Dean, I've only, I've, is it maple? Is it hard maple, clear white maple? Well, yeah, I've got one with maple and one with cherry. Is it close? The cherry's, close I wish the cherry was a little harder, but. It's a it's a French style, so it's a, a twenty. Yeah, inches. yeah, that, that's what I've made and sold. Uh, nothing, no finish at all. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, they'll flower it. So the flower will take care of it. Yeah, you know, sand it up to about twelve hundred, and just count on the 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 sanding to close the grains. The French, when they make it, they actually burnish the surface. You see it on the on the lathe, and they'll take a steel rod. And just turn that over, rub that over the turning rolling pin. So the wood is actually burnished and the grain is closed. Yeah. So it's not yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Yeah. I say burnish it with some chips. I yeah, did that. that. I, it's funny it's you should mention better. that. I, I literally, a week and a half ago, just made uh, a beechwood rolling pin at, because I had a piece of beechwood and I needed a rolling pin. and. I thought it was and the last one's beechwood. Exactly, <laughs> probably the best wood out there. But uh, depending on what you wanted to do, yeah, yeah, it's and, a good one for for um, for bleaching. Bill, mm, okay, yeah. So so, what would be the result if I used a walnut oil and 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 just friction polished it to polymerize the thing? Is that you wind up with a sealed piece of wood? Um, and you get a you get a, a nice feel and a nice look on the surface, but from a functional point of view, actually burnishing with the, the steel rod and closing the grain is a is a good solution also. All right. The mineral oil is something that you really should not put on wood. Um, does everyone know the story of the mineral oil and the butcher block? No, no, I I don't think I've heard that. Okay, back in the old days, and when there were actually butcher shops and butchers that worked on butcher blocks, at the end of the day, they had the, this huge draw knife looking thing that they would s scrape the top of the butcher, the cutting block with, which mm -hmm. took off wood and goo and stuff. Then they cover that with mineral oil, horse laxative, basically, in, in those days. And what that did was protect the, the open grain, because this is end grain wood protect the open grain from bacteria and goo settling into the wood. Okay, so it's just protecting a clean surface after they scrape it. Next morning, they come in, take the same scraping knife, scrape off the mineral oil, and you got a clean work surface to work on that day. Um, and it's just repeated over and over. It, it doesn't do anything for the wood. It, in fact, is a platform for bacterial growth, just to sort of put it into context. The other uh, option is if you have a, a be all system with the uh, buffing wheels. Yeah. You just buff it and that wood will look really, really nice. Yep. So I did do that. I buffed mine, but I, I did a lot of reading about it. And uh, and then, of course, I, I called one of my sisters who bakes a lot. She said, don't treat it with anything. Just, yeah. uh, just flower the rolling pin or the surface and, you know. And she said that uh, any of the 
rolling pin she's ever used that were treated, it, stuff just sticks to them and you can never stop it. So, so is the cherry is the cherry going to be hard enough that it's going to be functional as a rolling pin? Sure. sure. At yeah. least once. It depends what you're using the rolling pin with. If you're if you're beating somebody with it, it's probably not going to be such a good thing. But if you're actually rolling out dough, it'll work just fine. Well, if it doesn't work as a rolling pin, I'll use it, I'll use it to beat someone. So. No, actually, I used a cherry rolling pin yesterday, making a batch of old Polish recipe cookies. Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of times the the way you use a French rolling pin is you press down. So really, all you're doing is pushing on where you're going to be putting the pressure right. on the dough. Yeah. The other so thing is you're making sure thing. you get the, the little rings. Make the little yeah. rings. Another yeah. real quick question that is up there for a, a newbie question. I, I hope I'm past a newbie, but the, Mike, you had made reference to one cut earlier. One cut shellac is a sanding seal. One pound what? cut. I don't. Okay. Shellac comes in a can as a three pound cut. That's three pounds of shellac flakes to one gallon of alcohol. Okay. So shellac from the can is a three pound cut. If you take that, everybody has stopped. There we go, we're moving. If you dilute that one part of shellac from the can with two parts of denatured alcohol, you'll get a one pound cut. All right. So you're saying the bullseye, my can of bullseye is a three pound. Is it's a three pound cut. Now, right. Unless you've got the seal coat, that's two pounds. Yeah. No, I don't. I just got the. Okay. Just yeah, I was going to say seal coat is two pound de wax. Yeah. Which is what I, I like to use on furniture. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the wax it the wax in it gives it a little more stickiness. So for odd shapes like bowls and stuff, the wax shellac works a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. But the you know actually the the two pound cut diluted in half makes a great sanding sealer because there's nothing yeah. to get in the way. Huh. Yeah, that's what I use. What do you cut that with? Is it alcohol? Denatured alcohol. Denatured yeah. alcohol. Deep, Mike, you said you're using a spray bottle, right? Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the diluted shellac is good for, it's a nice sanding sealer. It works great for that, but I use it to stiffen the fiber. If you got a um, a spot that's not cutting the way you think it should. You got grains sort of going, you know, cattywampus. If you'll spray that with shellac, it'll stiffen it just enough that you're going to get a cleaner cut through it. Same with sanding. If you got a spot that's just not sanding the way you think it should, spray some shellac on it, let it dry. It'll sand a lot better because you stiffen the, the fibers of the wood just enough that the cut works better. The other thing is if you have a spot where you're going to use CA glue on, yeah, if you um, put some uh, sealer around that spot, you won't get the yep. stain of the CA stain. glue. Right. Yeah. Okay. Another question, as long as we're talking about that, um, I had the, the reasons I won't get into, went out and bought some wood hardener for something that was getting a little, a little funky on my deck. Um, I've got some wood, real pretty wood, but part of it is a little punky um can i use a wood hardener to firm that up is that the minwax one what the wood i think so yeah yeah as long as you use a mask that yeah, it smells like crazy um and it's not something you want the dust of in your lungs yeah, yeah I, hear. I i have used that um i can't I, I don't know if it didn't work very well because the wood was just too far gone or wasn't a good solution, but um, I have I have tried it. Uh, yeah, and maybe maybe because of the dust and the danger of that, I'll stay away from that. Um, I think maybe even real thin CA glue might be a right. better solution. Yeah. One of Dale Larson's first rules is to never turn bad wood. Don't waste your time. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> Life is too short I, to turn bad wood. That's right. I, I, I did make a bowl with the other part of it and just took the time to, I just did a lot of wet sanding that finally got the thing flattened out. And it's, it's very pretty. It just took a lot of time to do it. Problem with wet sanding or sanding 
punky wood is that you get it so uneven. It's yeah. I, yeah. I find that I get kind of undulations in the wood where you hit harder spots and softer spots and yeah. it just turns into a nightmare. I, I turned cottonwood one time and I'll never go back there again because it's the same thing. It just gets all wavy and nasty well, on you. And there again, this, yeah. the shellac spray um, will, you can sort of firm up the wood a little bit, but and maybe get a little better on it, but it's, it's you know, wet wood can be, wet rot, rotten wood can be problematic. Yeah. Unless you got a really Cotton nice wood. burl and you want to right. see a piece of it, then it might be worth your, your uh, yeah. effort. Cottonwood gets wavy and then you take a scraper to it and your, and your, your pullout yeah, yeah. goes about a, an inch deep. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. I was just happy to hear Mike say that there are pieces where you can't get a good cut in a certain area. I just thought I sucked. Yeah. No. <laughs> wood is, you know, well, you know, wood is unpredictable. It's, uh, mm -hmm. The tree had a, uh, a, you know, some kid hit it with a baseball bat 30 years ago and you got a compressed grain in one spot that's been amplified through the 30 years growth of wood. I mean, there's, it, wood is unpredictable. That's part of the fun of it, I think. Yeah. Les gave me that piece with the rock in it, and I'm going to put that in epoxy. <laughs> well, it's like Dale's wall, you know, the stuff he's found in wood. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that It used to be the far end of the wall. Yeah. Under the sign, free wood is never free. Yeah, Les, Les gave yeah. me that one with the rock embedded in it, and I've been th trying to figure out how I could turn that, and I just decided that, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embed that in epoxy first. Yeah, and it's you know, it's an unusual piece. But I want to I preserve turning... the rock in that. So, and, but the piece of wood's kind of punky, so I, I almost have to put in epoxy. Yeah, and I've never I was done turning a piece of. Though. I was turning a piece of wood from my partner's front yard, and and heard a ticking sound, and I shut the lathe off, and there was a big sixteen penny nail oh, that was yeah. about yeah. to come through the the heel of my hand as it revolved around. Yeah. Ow. I was at a street fair down in, in California. This was a couple of years ago and someone had a booth there that had a bunch of turned wood and one of the vases that he made, it was kind of a bowl of vase, he had named it buckshot because the, the, the piece of wood was littered with buckshot. And he, he said it beat up his tool, but it made for a very pretty piece. And, oh. and it was kind of fun. So, but he nicknamed it, he, he named the thing buckshot. Hopefully it wasn't a food vessel, <laughs> lead poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it was stainless steel shot if he was beating up his tools. Yeah. Yeah, and he had he had mentioned that. Oh. Oh, Dean, uh, I'll give you my two cents worth on wood hardener. I used to I had a whole bunch of very pretty wood that was punky, and I used a lot of that. But at the end of the day, you come to the the conclusion that's the consensus here that that kind of wood is just not worth your time because yeah, and some of it some of it is the wood is still salvageable <clears throat> if i get rid of the punky wood it it would yeah. be relatively small but it's very pretty yeah. wood so yeah. yeah i think i'll do that you can cut it you can get enough of that hardener in there to the point where you can cut it and then when like steve said when you go to sand it that still sands out faster than the, the wood around it yeah. You can't, you just can't win it. So now at the end of the day, it should go in the firewood pile unless yeah. you've got sentimental value. Or it will burn slowly if it's wet. Or you end up with a vase uh, the size of what Bill just showed us. <clears throat> I, All right. I don't know. I, I don't know. I got a piece. I got a piece of maple from a fire. Long, that big. <laughs> I got a piece of maple from a retired Navy captain that was wrapped in plastic. And I set it off the side and forgot about it. And like a year later, I got around to it. And when I removed the plastic, that thing was still soaking wet inside. It was spalted really nice. It was really yeah. pretty. And, uh, but when I was turning it, I was, I had the same problem where if you start sanding it, it kind of goes wavy on you. I turned my lathe up to 2,500, did a beautiful cut on it and it came out gorgeous. Yeah. You know, so John, I, I did the same thing. I had a piece that I forgot about, forgot I had was tucked back in a corner that I had wrapped in plastic when it was fresh and green. And when I found it, it had mold on it. This did too. Oh yeah. I got it. 
I got it out of Mike Porter's basement area. <laughs> and that would be a silver maple, wasn't it? It was. I still it's have a, a beautiful couple, bowl. I still have two more pieces of that. If you want to get rid of it, throw it my way. <laughs> Kaboom, this, <Stevie. laughs> this was last weekend's investment in some wood that I probably shouldn't have ever messed with. Um, oh, oh yeah. It. You know, that was Oops. a lot of time spent for it just to come apart, and it's all cracked in the top too. And I was adding glue and trying to salvage it. I mean, it's pretty, but I have more. But I don't know if I'm going to mess with it again. The funnel is a much paid. underappreciated form. Yeah. yeah, Mike, I've got a question for you. Have you ever heard of this so. stuff? goblet? Can't can't see it, John. Too close. Read it to us. It's a K-7002 clear wax sealer. Right. Who's the company? Sold right here in Portland. What is huh. it? It's an it's a wood sealer and grain oh. sealer. As in mm -hmm. anchor seal. It's it's like anchor seal, but it's at, it's made from. The reason why I ask is when I had that, before I sold my box truck, I bought a, that whole truckload of wood like five years ago. And I, I had two five gallon cans of this and that's what I've been using. I've got one unopened can, one five gallon. And it, it's like anchor seal, but I was just wondering if, it, if it's, if you know if it's any better than anchor seal or different. I use it all the time. And what's the name of the company that makes it? It is. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. <laughs> I, I don't remember the name of the company. I'd have to look on the other side of it. Well, if it works, it works. What's the number? K-7002 Clear Wax Sealer. Let's see. Walker Emulsions. That's right. It's water soluble. Mm -hmm. Does it say what's in it? Okay. There's there's a there's an oxymoron. Water soluble trying to seal water. No, it, it what's depends. wrong with this picture? <laughs> Actually nothing. The, the the fact that you can get poly, you know. Polyethylene glycol is waterproof, but it's also water soluble. Um, it's what happens when it actually bonds with itself. The fact that the, the monomers are water soluble as opposed to the polymer. Well, like I said, I had I had two five gallon jugs of that. I still got one brand new one that's unopened and half of the other one that I haven't used. So I'm probably gonna sell the five gallon can at the tool sale. I don't know. I, it, you know, if it's basically that's what the water soluble wax is what anchor seal is. Yeah. Um, this is a little thicker. Yeah. This is, I don't know if it works. Yeah. The hey, other one I had to take, I took the, the other one I took into uh, Sherwin Williams and had him shake it real good before I, because it's been sitting, it's been sitting yeah. for 10 years or so. Okay. Well, it's 10 o'clock. Um, since we have a uh, our renowned doctor here, Steve, you have anything good to say to us about the vaccine? Well, I think it's going to take a while for everyone to get it. I, I even healthcare workers, it's going to be a while. I think I the nearest time or the next closest time that I'll probably be able to get mine would be somewhere after January 11th. So it's not going to be real fast rolling out. They say there was 128,000 vaccinated the first day. So that's fantastic. And that's still a long way to go. It is. All we have is like 300 million more to go. Yeah. <laughs> so what are my chances? What are my chances that my trip to Europe in early June is actually going to happen? Swim. Same, same as my trip to June and uh, trip to Europe in <laughs> April. You know, I was yeah. gonna say, it's going to be pretty slim. Nike so, just announced we won't go back to the office until at least July. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, uh, Tektronix said not until end of or not until Q2, so not until May June time for for us to. Yeah. 
So um, I have two sisters that are nurses, one of them here in uh, Hillsboro. She's a neonatal intensive care nurse. And she thought she was pretty low, but she got called on Thursday and said to come in on Friday and get her vaccination because so many people that were on the list ahead of her declined. Really? Yep. Wow. That's disappointing. Why would you decline? Uh, you know, there's, there's just so many paranoid people about vaccinations, but what you have to keep in mind is, is that life expectancy before the age of vaccinations and antibiotics and in 1900 America, average life expectancy was 49 years of age. Well, you're not going to get a lot of wood turned if you're dying at 49 years of age. <laughs> I would right? have been dead for 10 years. <laughs> exactly. 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 You know, and, and and so the the idea that you turn away from your salvation is is not something that you probably ought to do. You probably ought to get your vaccines. Well, she went well, and got hers. She said, "You know what? Absolutely. Right. If you're not going to get it, and uh, and." I don't know. I, I don't know what OHSU stance on it is right now, but they, what if they, I don't know why they can't make it a condition of employment. When I was in the COVID. Oh, they can. They can. They, can. they do for flu. Yeah. Yeah. They do for flu. You know, if, if you don't take your flu shot, you're off staff. I think yeah. the problem is that a lot of people think a vaccine, uh, you get a little bit of the, uh, of the disease in the vaccine. Not this one. Okay. Well, yeah, no, this one's not. This one's not. This, this is. This isn't like a flu where they kill it off and just. No. no. This is no. a bit of the spike protein that you're yeah. making yourself. I think if people so understood they, that, there'd be less resistance. But yeah. You know, well, and there's a lot of disinformation going on about that about uh, all of the weird side effects. It's, none of them are true. Yeah. Just a little bit. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I made the comment, read your aspirin bottle or your ibuprofen. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Potential side effects up to and including death. Sure. <laughs> On aspirin. Well, the objection well, you know, we, used, this we used to recommend oh. that everybody with an estimated 10 year risk of heart attack of over 10% would take an aspirin a day. And then a couple of years ago, Harvard did this study that showed that all cause mortality was actually elevated by doing that. And so now, now only the people who've had known coronary artery disease or strokes are supposed to take an aspirin a day and everyone else yep. is not supposed to do that. Yeah. And you think of aspirin as being innocuous, but it's not, you know, it kills no. people. Tylenol I'm, kills I'm, people. I'm on, I'm on that, but that, for that very reason, so. Yeah, yeah. I, tylenol is still the drug of choice for suicide in Europe. It so is. Really? <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's a of if you're serious about it's a most them. unfortunate method uh, yeah. because yes. people will take a bunch of Tylenol and, and they'll go into a coma and then they'll come to and have all kinds of regrets and say, oh, I didn't really mean it. And then three days later, their liver fails yeah, and they die. Yeah. And you're on the liver transplant list. Yeah. I, you know, it's terrible. The, the objection that I've heard most is that this vaccine was developed so quickly and you try to explain to them, uh, there was a, oh, somewhere. On NPR, they were talking to one of the vaccine companies, explain, exploring the same thing. The you know, the measles vaccine took four years because you got to you got to grow the virus, you got to develop a, a heat killed virus. It, it took four years. They asked him, "All right, if you were going to develop a vaccine virus today, how long would it take?" And he said, "Was well, next week soon enough?" I mean, the difference between what goes into uh, an attenuated virus vaccine versus a, an, an RNA vaccine. Right is nothing. Is the sequence is known? You're, you know, I could have made this vaccine in my lab. If you know the sequence and and you know what portion of the right. the sequence you need, you you can cut that out and you can you can yeah. synthesize that. You can and, make it from scratch. And, oh you know, oh my god! The packaging. I think a lot. I think a lot of it is is the the uh, the approval process and the expense of trying to get funding for it. So one of the one of the things that I think everybody does, doesn't realize is, is the actual work doesn't take that long. It's all of the, B, I have to go get the funding to be able to take the next step, or I need the funding for the next step. With this case, all of that funding was automatically approved because the money was there. Ex right. Except the companies that actually produced the vaccine didn't take any of the government money. Yes. And then there's my brother. 
So my brother and, and some of his friends are convinced this was a <coughs> the uh, vaccines were pushed through to make Trump look good, so they don't want to take the vaccine. Well, that's, that's also very likely true, but it doesn't make any difference. I was going to say the trial still saying that it worked correctly. Yeah. 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 Okay, so trying to convince that group of people of that. Yeah. When they when they offer it to me, I'll take it. Yep. Good. Okay. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. There's, there's an app in the New York Times that will calculate how long it's going to take you to get vaccinated. You put in your name and what you do and your zip code, and it'll tell you how many people are in front of you on the vaccination list. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well. Yeah. Yeah, I look I look at it this way. I want the herd mental I want the herd protected. So the more people that get vaccinated, the high, the higher uh herd immunity we have. Yep. Okay guys, thanks a lot. Good good Bye -bye. discussion. Yep. Have a Merry Bye -bye. Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you. Bye -bye.